Welcome. We are so excited today to sit down with uh, Pastor Carla Porter. What a blessing she is to yes, our house. Uh, yes. How are you today? I'm very well, Tanya, and it's such a blessing to be here with you and Hannah. I've been looking forward to it. Well, we're going to have fun. This is going to, I think, I just, you know, going to be a beautiful conversation. Yes. Um, one of the things that I was so interested in hearing out about when we when we visited earlier last week was just how you came to know the Lord. Can you just start there with that story? It was it was incredible. Yes, everyone's salvation story is meaningful. I was 29 years old when I came to know the Lord. I was born into a good family. I was the oldest uh, of five children. And my dad took us to the Methodist Church every Sunday. We went Wednesday. I loved to go to church, but I did not hear about salvation. It. We were confirmed at 12, Okay. sprinkled in front of the church and given a little white zipper New Testament oh, wow. and told we were Christians. And so that was not enough to sustain me by the time I went to university. And I was put in uh, many situations I'd never encountered before in my sheltered life. (laughs) But I, uh, it was impactful in that all of my professors were openly atheist. And I had to take courses of philosophy and reasoning and where they proved, quote unquote, that God did not exist. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I uh, came out of university, I got my degree and came out, I had this thought, well, I no longer believe in God, but I'm not going to tell mom and dad because it would hurt them. So I kind of lived, I I was not born again, and I, of course, did not have the word guiding me. And I think that is one reason that I have such a heart for children and to guide them as early as possible in the work I do with orphans and vulnerable children to introduce them to the love of God and begin training them in the Word. Because while I was raised to be morally good, I was not raised in the Word. In fact, I had a really impactful incident when I was in the fifth grade. My Sunday school teacher was teaching us on Jonah being swallowed by a whale. So I I remember sitting in that class, and I was very intent on the story, and I've raised my hand, and I won't mention her name, but I said, <laughs> how could a big fish swallow a man? And she said, oh, this, this didn't really happen. <gasps> the Bible is full of myths, oh my. of stories. The stories aren't true, but it's good that you know these stories because they teach us to be good. And so my fifth grade Sunday school teacher told us the stories in the Bible are not true. They are myths. Wow. And do you know that had an impact on us? Absolutely. It did. That's why it's so important we teach the kids now and the authority of a believer, the authority that we that they have at their age so that they when they're in a situation where they are faced up against someone in the world that doesn't know the word. And is they telling come, lies. Yes. Then they can come back and they say, no, I know this is true. Right. And yes. they can speak to every area of their life. Exactly. It's so important. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to equip our children yes. so that when they go out into a, a world that is not only worldly, but actually demon infested yes. right oh, now, yes. Yes. that they are... Uh, strong in the word and and have a personal relationship yes. with God. That I was 29 years old. Do you know if you're not born again by the time you're 18 most it's a very small percentage that are ever born again. Wow. Yeah. You cannot imagine how grateful I am 
to be saved because I was in that percentage that it was very unlikely I would ever be born again. So we go, we just pour everything into the children. Oh, I love that. One of the favorite things that I say, and I repeat it to our kids too, is there's no junior Holy Spirit. Amen. There's there you not, go. There's, yes. not, there's not a second level or a lower level yeah. of that. Like yes. kids can experience the fullness of Christ now, right now. Yes. And especially, I mean, I, th- I think although, you know, your college experience might have been years ago, I think that's pretty normal today for young Christians to go to to university to go to college and then have an experience where they they have lots of opportunities to walk away yes. lots of convincing quote unquote arguments mm-hmm. against the word so it's mm-hmm. it's incredible that you even coming out of that got to a place of salvation it, I, I cannot tell you how in fact recently i heard a statistic that i think is important for us to know most americans are born again between the ages of nine and 13. After 13 years of age, it really has a downward trend. If you're not born again by the time you're 18, over 80% will never be born again. Wow, 80%. That's a huge number. Over 80%. I think it's about 83. It's it's over 80%. So the focus on our children and our youth, the need to focus there cannot be overstated. 100% agree. 100% agree. Yes. Yes. And they deserve all of the things, the excellence in ministry. In in the children's departments, it's so crucial. Absolutely. It's so that they know the stories and they know the truth of the stories. They know how to pray. They know how to come before the Holy Spirit. But most importantly, what you said, Pastor Carla, is a relationship with him. Absolutely. And that's one of my number one things that I'm so passionate about is teaching about intimacy with the Father. And I want to tell you, we have to teach the children uh, theology Mm. and prepare them with the truth for the arguments against the existence of God, against living by the word, being called intolerant Mm -hmm. if you live by the word. If we don't have that in them uh, before they leave our homes, it will be very difficult for them to navigate the years that follow if they're not rooted, grounded, convinced, and walking in it. Yes. So when my late husband, Wade, and I established... uh, Victory Faith Church in Nairobi, Kenya, we would tell the church, church, the kids are primary around here. Yes. Our youth are primary around here because customarily all the focus was on the adults. Sure. And the children were on the fringes. Yeah. But we did it the reverse. The children are primary The youth are primary. Amen. I love that. And so that to me is is the order. And and the you will find the adults becoming very supportive of all the outreaches to the children and youth that you do. That's amazing. That's amazing. Very cool. Yes. But you you said earlier you had a great, solid moral upbringing. We were taught to be good. Yeah. And you know, all my life and in fact I was married in my 20s and I never partied I've never smoked anything (laughs) that (laughs) the answer was no if you've seen the movie the Jesus revolution right well that was in the 70s I graduated from uh, university in 71 I believe it was 71 72 somewhere there and do you know, I mean, that was just all around, wow. but I never participated in it. And uh, um, I, I was married in my 20s, and that marriage uh, d- broke apart. And one reason was the he was going that way. Uh-huh. And, and I, thank and you, God, yeah. did not go that way. Yes. And, and in the midst of that, it was very painful for me. 
I was a school teacher and a dance teacher. I had a school of tap and ballet. Yes, I didn't know you did dance. Yes. I were, yes. Oh, yes, I've been tapping and shuffling. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and ball changing <laughs> <laughs> since I was four years old. Wow. So, um, so I, I had a lot of responsibility. And in the midst, when we agreed to separate, I went to stay with my aunt for the summer, and it was very challenging for me. I got back. I didn't know a thing about demons, remember. I didn't believe in any of that. <laughs> and when I got back at the end, end of the summer, he wasn't in, in the house that we had at that time. But I walked into it, and uh, an immediate feeling like I was going to have a nervous breakdown hit me. In fact, I, I was in the midst of having a nervous breakdown. Some kids from the high school came by to visit. You know, I remember waving goodbye to them from the porch, and I was under so much emotional pressure sure. that they were distorted. They seemed far away, oh. and they were just in my front yard. Oh. And um, that night I prayed, Lord, <laughs> if you're real, I, I I was so desperate, I prayed. I hadn't prayed in a long time. And um, I said, if you're real, if you don't help me through the night, I'm not going to make it. And would you send me two friends? Mm. And by that I meant, oh. I don't know what I meant, but I needed something other than the superficial friendships yes, I had yes. because of course I wasn't a church attender I knew people but I didn't know them sure. that connection. as that you would call a close friend yes. and so I woke up the next morning my goodness I had slept in spite of the intense emotional pressure that I was under I woke up and it was the phone that was uh woke me up and one, I answered it, and it was the mother of one of the children I taught in dance school. Aww. And she said, she opened the conversation saying, Carla, do you ever feel like it's hard to stay married? Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's how she opened the conversation. You know, yes. you don't say. <laughs> yes, you don't say. And that would become friend number one. And oh. I put the phone down, and while I was sitting there, now this was my prayer being answered. I was so astonished. The phone rang again while I was still sitting there. Within just 30 seconds of putting the phone down, we still had phone lines back then. Right. <laughs> Much and, different experience yes, than today. It rang again. I picked it up, and it was my next-door neighbor, Mrs. Scarborough. And she was a Pentecostal lady that just drove me up the wall. <laughs> and I just thought she was crazy. Oh, my goodness. And so there was a, a bit of a distance between our homes. And in her backyard, she raised chickens. <gasps> oh, so goodness. every two weeks, I would go across that expanse and knock on her door and ask for to buy eggs. And she would tell me about Jesus. And I just thought she was out of her mind. And uh, one time, uh, she was getting the eggs for me, and I said, Miss Scarborough, what's wrong with your hand? She said, oh, I smashed my thumb, and it's infected, and it looked awful. It was so swollen, pussy, red streaks. I said, well, you better go to the doctor. And she said, oh, no, I'm going to church tonight, and Jesus is going to Amen. heal me. <laughs> Well, I didn't say amen. I said, <laughs> like, what, what in the a world? Looney Tune. <laughs> yes. oh to make gosh. a long story short, and I avoided her other than buying eggs. That was the <laughs> that was the second phone call, and so I answered the phone, and she said, "Carla, where have you been all summer?" I said, "Well, Miss Scarborough, I've been away," and she said, "Well, I want you to know, I've been praying for you." I put the phone down. I got my bathrobe on. I was still in my pajamas. And I ran across that expanse of lawn several yards and just threw myself into that dear 
woman's arms and I cried and cried and she became so dear to me. She had I gave my heart to Jesus that day. Praise God. There were my two phone calls that I'd prayed about the night before. Your two friends. And I had two very dear friends. And in just a few days, you know, I didn't say the prayer of salvation right then. I just believed. Later, when I found out we needed to pray, I said it over and over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to do this. Yes, I'm yes, going to pray. Every Lord. time someone prayed, I prayed right along right. with them. But a few days, just within like three or four days, she brought some of her friends from the Broken Bow Assembly of God Church and got me baptized in the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. And she put me immediately in the Word. She put me in Kenneth Hagan, uh, Norval Hayes, and John Osteen, which is uh, Joel's father. Yeah, right. And and Norval Hayes. Did I say him? Norval yes. Hayes. And I'm telling you, I... My life was totally changed within three or four days. I was so, like, my nerves had been so affected, and it was demonic. Later, I could look back on it. The minute I walked in the house, I was, from being away all summer, really Mm -hmm. attacked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to start school two weeks later, and I I would not have been able to do that in the condition I, I had been in. So... I I had a profound conversion, and so profound (laughs) that even later, my dear father, my mother would be born again, and my dear, but my Uh dear father told me, because they knew nothing of the Holy Spirit, and they, my father told me, Carla, we even as a family would have family meetings about you. In this Holy Spirit talking in tongues business, and we were wanting to take you to a psychiatrist <gasps> to get psychiatric wow. help. But my father himself would get baptized right. in the Amen. Holy Spirit. <laughs> yes, Bring that, them all. that was a so... while down the road, but but they became convinced I was sane, and. Um, and, you know, they watch the transformations take place yes. in my life. And the fruit. Yes. Yes, of God's goodness. And and I love how fruit. you just totally immerse yourself in the word totally. so quickly. Give me all of it. Totally. I want all of it. In fact, I was subscribed to everything <laughs> back then. <laughs> you were hungry for it. I was so yeah. hungry. But I, I took Look Magazine, Life Magazine, Reader's Digest, National Geographic, all the magazines, you know, I was a voracious reader. And they, and of course, a couple of daily newspapers. And they would just pile up in the front yard. I'd go get the mail out of my mailbox and just put it in the trash, go take a garbage bag, gather up all the newspapers. I was really weaned from that yes. for years. That right. I, I didn't know anything going on except I was the in word. the Word. Amen. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so many of the things you say are reminiscent of some of the things that I, I didn't get saved till I was 19. So oh. I I relate to that. And I relate to your family thinking you were off your rocker. Really? Uh, <laughs> but one time before, um, later, years later, my sister was complaining to my mom. She tells me this story all the time <laughs> that she was like, I don't know, Tanya in that church. It was all when we lived in Oregon and stuff. She goes, I don't know anything that's going on with Tanya in her in her relationship or her Christian whatever. She goes, but you got to look at her life and you got to see God's doing something. Yes, I wow. mean you can't deny the blessing that's there. And she's yeah. saying all these things and not having any idea why. Yes. So I re- I relate to that as family being like, what is up with you? Yes, yeah. yes, so, and but. and that's how kind of the context my dad. Right. eventually spoke to me after some months he said we we decided you are <laughs> we decided <laughs> yes. at our family meeting we all <laughs> came together and we decided <laughs> so cute. that you haven't gone off the deep end <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes oh, my goodness. so within um Two years I was in the ministry. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. So that was 1978. <clears throat> and then 
late 78. And in uh, a number of months later, I, uh, I was sitting, as you do when you live alone, eating breakfast one Saturday and reading. And I heard Carla. I looked up because I lived alone, yes. but it was that loud. Yes. When you go, leave everything here for your parents. I had oh, no wow. idea I was going yeah. anywhere. And so a few months later, in fact, at the beginning of, seven, let's see, the beginning, it was in the early months of 70, of 80, of 80, I went on a Daniel fast, and I had heard of a Daniel fast, and I, I was hearing that God has a plan for your life. Mm. You know, I'd never heard that before. Wow. I thought you just chose a good vocation and you made a living and you were a good person. Now, this was, you know, I was growing in the word, but this thing about a plan for my life didn't come just immediately. Right. So now I'm hearing God has a plan. And then I hear this voice, Carla, when you go, oh. when you go, well, I had no idea I was leaving. That, that was a shock. So on this Daniel fast, it was just about uh, three months after I heard that, I, I was praying for the will of God. The last day of the fast, I was here in Fort Worth, Texas to visit my sister who was at Southwest Theological Seminary here uh -huh. in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I met her. The, the fast is over that day, and she and her boyfriend said, well, let's go to such and such cafe, which was around the campus. So we, this is the last day of the Daniel fast, and we're sitting at a table, and the waiter took our order, and then he came back to the table. He said, you know, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'm just impressed to say Jerry Savelle Ministries is nearby. And they have a Wednesday night service, and this was Tuesday. And so I just thought I should let you know that, and he walked, turned around and walked away. <laughs> and so I told my sister, Tamara, and her boyfriend, you know, I've heard of Jerry Savelle. I don't know who he is, but I've heard on Kenneth Copeland tapes, he has mentioned Jerry Savelle. So we found out where his ministry was located. We went there, found out where it was, and found out the service time, and we were there that Wednesday that's night. That's awesome. Isn't that right awesome? Right place, right time. That's why it's so important. When God gives you a word to give it to somebody, you go and you give it. Praise yes. God for that man that yes. gave you that word. And that was a gift of the Spirit. Yes. Right. Helping to order my footsteps. I was here in Fort Worth from Broken Bow, Oklahoma, wow. to see right. my sister. And... So we went that Wednesday night. Dennis Burke preached. And on the way out the door, a woman named Evelyn Gunther, she was a love, a greeter, or an usher, greeted me and asked me my name and where I was from. And I told her, Broken Bow, Oklahoma. She said, oh, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a school teacher. And she said, we need school teachers. And I said, really? And she said, yes. Why don't you think of pray about applying? Oh. So I got the information. I went back to Broken Bow and eventually called the ministry and agreed to have an appointment. And I came back to Fort Worth, had an appointment, and they hired me to teach in their Christian school. Brother Jerry had a Christian school at that oh, time. Yeah. So I taught. John Copeland and Kelly Copeland. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yes. Um, I taught. You taught all their kids. That's so I awesome. did. I taught one of the guys that does the Victory News. Anyway, I <laughs> was hired by Jerry Savelle Ministries to come and teach wow, in their Christian amazing. school. And that is, that is the beginning of the connection you had with yes. this, this house. Yes. Okay. And so 
I taught the next year in Christian school. I met my late husband, who was uh, Brother Jerry's first cousin, Wade. And he's been in heaven since 2012. So anyway, just, Carla, when you go, leave everything here for your parents. Right. And then they got involved in a church in Broken Bow that God raised up that taught the word. Oh, wow. You know, it's just amazing how God puts pieces of your life together. And then I went into ministry within, I was born again in 78. And by 1980, I was in the ministry. Yeah, you were teaching. Yes. And it was, was it a few years, about three or four years later that you became an associate minister? Is that what I heard? Okay. Yes. And so, well, I went to the Bible school. Okay. So I graduated from the Bible school, Brother Jerry had at that time. And I had it in my mind, I would go back to teaching school. Sure. That's what you always did, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was trained to do. Shall I tell this part? Yes, Yes, we're so excited. We're so ready. We've been waiting, anticipating. Okay. So, uh, one time, uh, one, so I'm, I've graduated from Bible school and now I'm in this interim period, period. And Wade came to me and said, Brother Jerry spoke to me today and said, tell Carla I'd like for her to come on staff as an associate minister. Wow. And I said, well, Wade, let me pray about it. (laughs) But I I didn't intend to pray very diligently, I must admit. Because I'm telling you, ministry is work. Yes. And I'd been a public school teacher. And then I came and I'm teaching at a school at a ministry, which I absolutely loved the school. Yes. But we were... We had to paint our rooms and, and uh, all the, the hands and feet of Jesus hanging oh on the walls. Oh boy! Yes, but let me tell you something that hadn't been formed in me yet, and and it was a lot of physical work that, as a public school teacher, I was accustomed was done for us. Oh sure. By janitors and employees of a school system, we came in and taught school. And that was it. Yes. We right. didn't clean our room. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. We didn't right. paint our room. Right. We didn't empty the trash. Yes. And all of that. So anyway, I told Wade, no, I would not be coming on staff. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, right and, and, you know, just bear with me. We're going to get there. <laughs> and um, so we were attending Grace Temple Church. Brother Harold Nichols Nichols, was the pastor, and he had this prophetess come in. And she was, I I was very focused on what she was saying and very intent on, I'd never seen anyone like her before operate as she did. And she had this long flowing gown on, like Catherine Kuhlman would wear. And so she, she was... Not theatrical, but eye-catching to watch her. And I I was really focused on her. Suddenly, out of her mouth, Mm. came a trumpet. And it kept growing and growing. And it, it was coming and coming and getting larger. And it was coming toward me. Oh. And it stopped just a few feet from me and said... Don't refuse this job I'm offering you. Oh, my goodness. That's awesome. Wow. So when the service was over, (laughs) on the way home, I said, Wade, tell Brother Jerry I happily accept this job. Oh, my goodness. And, y'all, I can look back and see what, what was needed. Right. I considered myself a servant of God and the word was being formed in me and you know I'm going to tell you three things you have to serve you have to become to accomplish the will of God you have to be a servant of God number two you serve the word and number three you serve people amen and see that full servanthood When I said no, 
that was not formed in me yet. There were aspects of servanthood yes. that I, I did not have formed in me. And I, I wasn't interested in continuing with a job. Mm-hmm. But the Lord was bringing me in to a calling to serve his people. And that was not formed in me yet. Where there would, and what was not formed in me yet to the degree that it would need to be formed in me to fulfill those, that threefold call mm-hmm. serving God, serving his word, and serving his people is that the love of God needed to continue being formed in me. Mm-hmm. Because it's out of love that comes compassion yes. for people. Amen that you will do anything for uh, to fulfill the call that wants to express that love and compassion Amen. to them. I'm not sure I've heard the gospel and ministry summed up so clearly in those three points yes. and being wrapped in love. Mm. Uh, I think people have an idea that ministry is pulpit and lights and, you know, lights and shows and the great things, but you're, your servanthood and your heart for Lord was formed in those times that were outside of the public eye, weren't they? Oh, absolutely. And nothing has impacted the love of God and developed it, let me say that, to the degree that my work with orphans and vulnerable children has. Will you, will you spend a few minutes talking about what that work has meant to you? Well, it continues to expand. But I in um, the early 2000s, 2001, my late husband, we, we both were impressed to do a missions trip with our church in Nairobi, Victory Faith Church in Nairobi. And so he rented a big school bus, um, or a public bus, and took a number. I mean, he filled it up with members of our church and all their equipment and everything. And I stayed with the church, one of us, but he he was the, you know, the big, strong guy that definitely would need to lead the mission. And I stayed with the church in Nairobi, and they took out on a lengthy missions trip. They went through Kenya and Uganda and Rwanda. Rwanda had been through a horrific uh, civil war yes. and genocide. And, and, and Rwandans had fled to our church. And so wow. we had great compassion for them. And so that was all part. But one of the things he did was a member of our church had returned to her rural home. That would be the area that she had been born from Nairobi to spend her last years there. And she had contacted Wade and said, Pastor, I wish you would come and see the orphan problem here. And of course, HIV AIDS, they think, started in the Kenya, Uganda area. In that area is the epicenter of the AIDS pandemic. There's still a pandemic there. But um, in 2001, he went, and so it was very rural, near, near Lake Victoria and the Uganda Islands. It, it was that area. And as they were bouncing along, <laughs> pulling up where they were to go, Wade looked out, and he saw uh, what looked like furrows. You know how you plow? To plant seed, it creates furrows, and as is traditional in Kenya, he went in and saw the, um, had tea, you have to have a greeting, and they took tea, and he said, well, Mama, I'm here to see the orphans, where are they? And she said, well, Pastor, they're right out front. And he said, I didn't see any kids, so they went out the door, And she clapped her hands and she said, Kujahapa Watoto, which means (laughs) children come here. And what he had thought were furrows 
were the children buried in the dirt because they had never seen a Mazungu before. And that's a white man. Just going to ask. Uh, I was going to yeah. ask what a Mazungu was. Yes. So, thank and you. That, so they, they were afraid oh, of, wow. of the Mazungu. Yeah. And Wade was a tough, former, in his pre-born-again life, motorcycle outlaw. We have a gentler, kinder expression <laughs> of riding motorcycles here yes. at Heritage of Faith. But, uh, no, he was on the outlaw side of it. So a burly, tough guy, ex-military and all of that. And I'm telling you, he wept and wept as he took when they got home, and he was telling me about all the trip, that encounter with those children. I mean, I sat there and cried with him. I hadn't even yeah. seen them, but just we just agreed when he expressed they were so thin, covered in dirt, dressed in rags if they had anything on, and uh, so full of disease, barefooted. I mean, he had never seen children in that condition before. And so we agreed, although we had no finances for it, we would start sending money for them to have something to eat every day because they would take turns sleeping in trees at night. Wow. So the animals wouldn't get them. Mm. They, they would be chased away by the villagers because it was thought if your parents and family members had died of AIDS, then you were bewitched. Mm -hmm. So the mentality that this is a result of witchcraft meant you were rejected. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were absolutely. And, you know, they would have stones thrown at them like you would throw stones to chase away a yes, dog, yes. That, an unwanted animal. And so, I mean... So what we did, we started saving money and taking up offerings in the church, and we got $5,000 together. Uh, this was several months later. This, this would be in 2002. And so we had some doctors and nurses, and they knew lab technicians, and we were going to do a medical clinic in Budalongi, Kenya. And so we leased tents, and everybody camped out, and the day came for the clinic, and it, they set up everything. And we had a lot of medicine, and I'm telling you, all day long, I watched people be dragged through the bush and carried people too infirm to walk. They would be carried into the clinic, and... We worked all day long. We saw over 500 people that day. Wow. So many of them were infected with AIDS. And, uh, we had, I, I saw for the first time infestations of jiggas. These are mites that burrow under your toenails, and mm -hmm. they come into your skin. They lay worms, and the worms go to your joints. Your feet are first, and... Uh, the terrible infestation of these uh, jiggas. And I, I saw boys being held down, young boys. Uh, some of them were the orphans Wade had seen, but they were infested with these jiggas because they went barefoot in the dirt. Mm. And they would, without anesthetic or anything, take a knife and start digging wow. the worms out. Oh I mean, they will eventually come up into your chest cavity. Sure. So it had to be done that way. It had, yes. there's no, if you gave them uh, any kind of painkiller or anything like that, it would excite the jiggas and they would head up to the heart and lungs. So it, it was so primitive oh. and horrifying for me to see. I saw things that day I'd never in my life seen. Yeah. And I was tremendously impacted. I'd never seen children in the condition, much less the adults. I'd never seen children in this condition before. And that was the beginning 
of a deeper work of servanthood in my life. And we got home from that. So Wade had seen it. Now this trip to Budalongi, I had seen it. And we would never be the same again. And that was the beginning of our work with orphans and vulnerable children. Now, from that point to now, how long have you guys been in Africa? How long has your ministry been there? It's been... It's from... We went in 1987. Wow. That's amazing. So I never thought I would leave Africa. Right. And I was... All I wanted was the plan of God. Remember, I didn't yes. always know God had <laughs> right. a plan. Yeah. Right. So when you get started a bit late, you certainly don't want to deviate. Yes, yeah, sure. So I was packing in 2020, March of 2020. I'd already shopped. I was packing to return to Kenya when we got up and went into lockdown. Yes, I remember yeah. that moment. I remember that moment. Yeah, I, I didn't was, even, I thought, lockdown, what does it mean, lockdown? Yes, yes, I was over, I was actually over at the ministry doing Brother Jerry's makeup, and they walk in and tell him, and, really? and, and that was my first time hearing of it. They're like, yes, churches are shutting down, yes. and that was like my moment, and I'll, I'll never oh forget that, yes. and so you were packing, yes. leaving to go to Kenya. I was, you know, my ticket wow. was there, Ev- everything, I was just waiting for the day that, that I would depart. And we went into lockdown. And you think it was severe for us? It was really severe for Kenya. And so I've not been back physically since that time. But, of course, thank God Wade was a very strong leader. And we we made teaching our leaders, Mm -hmm. uh, we called it leadership training. Like you're empowering them so that way when you're gone, they can still lead and do the things that That need to get done. That was one of our main objectives is when you plant, you want it to remain. You want to bear fruit that remains. Amen. And so thank God I had terrific leaders, Pastor Davies Kamori, uh, his wife Tina, uh, Mama Ruth, all all of our leaders, they're like family. Yes. They're they right. are family. And then but now I've got another family. It, it was just a few short days ago. I, I don't know how it came up in conversation, but I was sitting in church some months ago. And I was just sitting there and looking around the church, and my heart said, I did not think it, but it was like my heart spoke. And I said, my heart said, Lord, I love this church. And it was heritage of faith. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't in any way diminish my love for Victory Faith Church. But the Lord enlarged my heart Mm -hmm. to embrace more more, Mm -hmm. and to embrace Heritage of Faith Churches as a great love in my own heart. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Our motto here at Heritage of Faith is making winners in life. And it's Mm. awesome to hear everybody's different perspective on what making a winner in life is. So my question for you is what is making a winner in life to you? What does that mean to you? Well, I would say I've already spoken of it, and that is letting the Lord train you as his servant. We have to have the mindset, I am not here to do my own will. If there is an aspect of my will that is not yet conformed to his will, this this is something I say, uh, it, it can come out of my heart, in my mouth in various ways. Lord, is there anything I'm missing, any any way, any of my ways that are displeasing to you, any way I'm not yielded or I have missed you? I want your will. Yes. Well, if you're going to have the will of God, you have to do the three things I right. said. Serve God, serve his word, and serve his people. That will make you, if you take on that mentality, he will consistently work on all three areas in your life. He will work through his word. He will work through the spirit. 
He will work by giving you assignments. He will work as you um, engage with other people. This servanthood, when Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. If we will take on that mentality, I am not here to live for myself. I am here to serve the will of God. I am here to serve his people. If we take on that mentality, it you may never have your name in headlines. You may never have your name splashed across the television screen, but you will be a winner in life. Amen. If you allow God to create the heart of a servant who by the end of his life, Peter, who was a pretty self-willed, he had a strong self-will, but at the end of his life, uh, we're told that Peter was crucified upside down because he did not want to be right. crucified. He did not count himself worthy to be crucified in the same manner that Jesus was crucified. Mm. So they crucified him upside down. He was hard-headed. He was stubborn. He was impetuous. He often didn't think before he spoke. You know, it's not that we're perfect. None of us are. But he was willing to go and do whatever it was the Lord had for him to Amen. do. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, I think your life truly reflects that. It truly reflects coming from, you know, going from line upon line. I'm going to become a servant this way. I'm going to serve God this way. I'm opening myself up to whatever he has me. I mean, I can't imagine Wherever seeing... Wherever you need me, God. Well, yeah. Yes. I mean, me? to see those yes. babies that needed that much medical care, mm. I mean, how could you not be stirred with compassion? Yes. yes. So um, we want to say thank you for serving God faithfully yes. and being such thank an incredible you, example to us as young ministers in the gospel. Yes. Praise it's, God. It's really great to hear and to glean from the wisdom of people who have walked the road ahead mm. of us. Thank sure. you, Anna. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tanya. You're welcome. It's been an honor to be with you girls. I've admi I admire you both and watch you move in service and how you're so kind to people. I, I really appreciate both of you. Well, we it's a blessing <laughs> to be counted as family with you for sure. I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, we were just so blessed by this time. I really believe that uh, this will uh, just be an encouragement to lots of people. In the show notes, we're going to have linked uh, Victory Faith Church in Kenya, the website there where uh, most of Carla's ministry, Pastor Carla's ministry is located. And you'll be able to see and if you feel led to sow into what the work that's going on there and see the faces of these people that have become family to her there. We'll also link a few of the messages she's preached here in this house at Heritage of Faith in case you weren't there and you missed out on what an anointed preacher she is and teacher. We want you to have access, quick access to that too. So anyway, we thank you for listening. Tune again next Friday for another winning conversation.